Right. So um, first, I think uh, introducing ourselves at this point would be a really good idea. So um, I'm Kathy Goldstein, uh, acupuncture physician at Integrative Health and Allergy Center. And this is Dr. Mike. Dr. Dr. Michael Wormier, uh, also Integrative Health and Allergy with Brain Optimization Institute. Excellent. Um, so what our topic is for today is um, learning disabilities, ADD, ADHD, uh, you know, any kind of uh, learning disabilities, but maybe if they fall, you know, uh, these days, <laughs> it seems like so many kids are falling on the spectrum, uh, regardless of whether we actually feel like they are on the spectrum or not. Um, you know, we don't like Generally speaking, we I know in our office we don't like to diagnose or have diagnosis because it's usually just an adverse effect from something. So in the uh, you know so for uh, over for about thirty years we've been working with um, AD, ADHD kids, kids learning disabilities, you know um, Hunter's disease, things like that for, you know, in the direction of looking at uh, uh, hypersensitivities or, or allergies. And we've had some parents come in and say, you know, I feel like my child was okay before a vaccine and now I'm seeing some fundamentally uh, slow development issues or, you know, eye contact issues, usually coming along with like skin issues. So we've seen that a lot in our office. And then um, also just even uh, generally um, because a lot of kids are vaccinated so young, maybe not even knowing why that ADD is. I mean, I certainly would fall have fallen on the ADD spectrum and maybe even, as you and I have talked about, potentially even the uh, uh, autism spectrum just because of just the hyperactivity and, you know, everything that they're diagnosing today. Um, but, and I clearly, clearly had food allergies. You know, I had the geographic tongue that indicates a B vitamin deficiency. And, um, you know, I think just even in general, the kids that we've seen that we've treated from the direction of food allergies have done amazing. Um, one of the things that we're really integrating now in our office with what you bring to the table is the neurology of it, because we can treat the sensitivity and the hypersensitivity and the allergies that can um, cause not only learning disabilities, but emotional stress kind of syndromes. Uh, but being able to integrate it on the neurological level with the physiology makes it go so much faster. So I wanted to definitely let people know what we're doing and what you bring to the table in the office. So, um, what, so in the in the form of what we're talking about, like maybe kids who have allergies, and we can move to kids that just don't. But kids who have allergies, how what you do integrates it the nervous system faster. Yeah, and I think that's a great you know kind of lead in is. You're right. Everybody's kind of on the spectrum now. They're getting diagnosed with this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, I oftentimes tell patients, yeah, the doctor called you a name or they called your kid a name. But did they really talk about what that means from a, you know, my, my view or my lens that I look at things is what does that look like from a neurophysiological perspective? And, and that is there's a lot more people getting diagnosed because I think a lot less people are eating food. You know, even if you're trying sometimes, you know, busy moms, busy family, they try really hard to put good food on the table. But unless you really know what you're looking for, a lot of times you're getting GMO foods or foods that have additives or, you know, it looks really nice when it says fortified with uh, or those types of terminology, but that's still manufactured food to a large extent. So, you know, I think we've got a lot more kids that whether they're allergic or not, are getting exposed to a lot more things that their brain and their nervous system and their immune system is having to deal with. Right. So I think, you know, first and foremost, we've got to look at that part of it and how can we eliminate some of those triggers? How can we eliminate the effect of that? And then neurologically, what areas does that affect? You know, if you look at something like ADHD, a lot of the research out there says that it's a frontal lobe thing or the front part of the brain that is affected, which makes sense with the diet stuff too, because the frontal lobe and, and the other part in the back of the brain called the cerebellum are the most affected, what we say metabolically, or by what you eat and what you put into your mouth. So if we're going to have bad foods, those are going to be the first two things affected. And then you're going to see things like attention the ability to be social and interact with others, 
things like balance and coordination that really show up issues in those areas. So. Okay, so just to make sure that, so on the concept of where, you know, if, if foods are gonna interact with your body on a metabolic process, meaning that how our body metabolizes it and is able to use it or not use it, and if it can't use it, how it's able to get rid of it if it's a toxin. And then yep. those symptoms show up on top of that. Yeah, and then the area of the brain that's most metabolically affected are those two areas that are most associated with things like ADHD, dyslexia even. You know, one thing that we see a lot in the office, um, we had a, a couple of them in this week actually, are kids that have a dyslexic diagnosis and it's not really true dyslexia, but because of the way their brain is developed or really the way their brain has been forced to adapt to what its surroundings are has changed how they're able to read and how they're able to process language and words. Okay, so uh, in the process of you know what we do in the office in general, be some cleanup, some you know things that just get the body to function as it needs to to function on a uh, digestive level and metabolic level. As far as being able to move them forward quickly and having the parents and the kids and the children be able to see the results and be excited it's when for example with the with the one that you mentioned who was diagnosed um you said that it wasn't actually uh um a, a, a true diagnosis so what was the outcome for that and how quickly could you see that change well so with him we saw a change in in his first visit um okay. they came in and, and so they wanted to do a diagnosis of dyslexia the school did, but that has to be done by a, a medical psychologist. Right. So they hadn't quite gotten there yet. But mom noticed also that he's having headaches a lot, and especially when he does math or when he's got to read. So they had heard about us from another patient that had gotten had, had a similar thing going on. And um, when he came in, you know, it's it's real hard for kids to read sometimes, right. and if your eyes aren't working correctly, there's no way you're gonna be able to read. And we all kind of associate eye fatigue and headaches and oh, I might need glasses or those types of things. But for kids, it's a little bit different. Kids, first off, shouldn't really need glasses. And they very often don't show a, like a visual deficit, like being able to read letters on the wall, that kind of thing. But what'll happen with kids when those two parts of the brain, again, don't develop in the right order, they struggle to move their eyes together or at the same time. So the left eye might lag behind the right one a little bit or vice versa, depending on what hand they are. But the real telltale sign, and for this kid, it was, you know, mom and dad saw it immediately, is when I had my thumb here, like at the bridge of his nose, and I moved it closer to him like that, instead of his eyes being able to track the object coming in, he actually went like this, and his whole body moved away from me. And yeah, we call it a withdrawal response. He was running away from the target because his eyes couldn't converge on it. And, you know, dyslexia makes sense as a diagnosis, but I think his true diagnosis is what's known as a convergence insufficiency, meaning his eyes can't converge on the target. And when you read, that's the first thing that has to happen. Uh, okay, right, because uh, you're, you're converging to single letters, you're not looking at the whole page, and so what right. happens when he would converge to try to read, it, he, he, you just, the nervous system, the brain just kind of makes stuff up and flips them, and yeah. Yeah, yeah it's got to fill in the blanks, and, and make stuff up is a great thing. Our brain actually fills in about 30 to 40 percent of the sensory stimulation that it takes in. Or what basically what that means is 30 to 40% of what you see is actually created by the brain because of blind spots in the eyes and, you know, your eyes moving in certain directions. Right. Or certain ways. Okay. Um, and when you read, you actually read words as pictures. So if your right eye is seeing a different picture than the left eye is, then yeah, you're going to flip the words. You're going to be that kid in class that, 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 that re re reads l l l like th this. Right. And, and they get made fun of, and then they don't want to read, and then they withdraw, and then yeah. you start to see all of the emotional stuff that goes along with that too. Right, 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 right. Okay. And so, uh, and so then, as far as um, you know, just looking at the person as a whole, um, you know, making sure that we're you're resolving the immediate issue, which is is being able to have them function. Uh, in school without all of that stress and being able to really perform. I've seen, you know, our, our kids go from, you know, 
D students to A students, uh, you know, just in the process of getting through some of that, some of the um, changes that we do. Um, but we also want to make sure we're treating the body as a whole. So once you get that brain, you do what you're, you know, what, what you're doing where you're re-educating the nervous system because our brain has that neuroplasticity so it can learn. So once you're teaching it how to relearn the correct way and being able to see that, what's the process of the big picture, like making sure that the whole being is taken care of? Yeah, well, you know, kind of the three things that I look at, the three pillars is we look at structural, we look at metabolic, and then we look at physical or, or neurological, which I think kind of go together. Um, so, you know, one, are they moving enough? Are they getting enough exercise? Are they fueling their body with what their brain needs to be healthy? Right. So whenever we put together a plan, you know, and it's the number one question from parents is, you know, are you, can you fix this? And then how long does it last? Uh, right. Right. Always thing with kids and that was you know this kiddo today it was the first thing his parents asked okay that's great because I see his eyes are working but how long is that gonna last right. and you brought up a really good term neuroplasticity well it might only last for a day or two at first just like if you are learning a new skill like shooting baskets you know you might only be if you only practice once a week you might only get good that day and the next time you come out seven days later you, you need to kind of do this on a regular basis at first um, and then it's not longer. Yeah. And then the idea is, is that once we get the nervous system back in line and, and integrated back again, then just being physical and, and walking and moving and running and playing like kids do and fueling the body with the proper food. And we make recommendations on all that kind of stuff as well. Um, you know, to make sure they're getting the proper nutrition too. So. Right. Okay, great. Great. So, um, you know, initially, it, what it might look like for, for a parent and the, and the kids is that they might come in three times a week initially, um, maybe even more, or would three times a week be Yeah, enough? depending on the kids. Sometimes it's twice. You know, if their system's kind of fragile, sometimes you got to start out a little lighter. I've had patients where, you know, and you've seen them in here, where they're here for five days. Um, yeah. and throw a whole bunch at them that first week but you see a huge change by Friday and then they go home with some exercises and, and then we kind of keep the ball rolling after that. But yeah, those are mostly our long distance patients. If they're coming from outside of the state or country, you're, we're, we're pretty, it's pretty heavy duty. It's, it's hard for the nervous system to get, you know, that much uh, push. Um, it's a, the, it, you know, if you're local, it's nice to be able to do two, three times a week initially and work up you know work through that process summer of course is a great time to really get that going because you also are um, uh, setting up a program where kids can come in and do some of the games that help develop different parts of the nervous system as well yeah yeah so that's kind of the summer program the almost brain summer camp or neuro summer camp um, you know it's a great time you brought up a great point is can you exercise their brains in the absence of stress that goes along with school? Kids, especially now, even more than when I was in school, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of um, you know, pressure to succeed and pressure to perform put on these kids. And school is almost fun when I was going. And now you know, they've got three different languages they're learning. They got new math, which I still can't figure out. Um, <laughs> all sorts of things that they're just, they're pressured more than ever. So summer's a great time because we, you know, we make it fun. That's one of the best compliments I had. And I think I've told you this story before. There was an eight year old that came in from Ohio and um, he was here for five days and we did our therapies and we worked with him for the first four. And I was talking to his mom on Thursday, at his last visit and saying, you know, tomorrow we're going to retest everything. We'll go through this. And a little boy walks up to mom and was like, Hey mom, when do we start therapy? And I looked down at him like, dude, we've been doing therapy for four days. And it was great because he just thought it was games and play. Um, I had one kiddo that I dressed up as Spider-Man every day that he came in because we told him it was his superhero training. So he got to dress like a superhero and I got to dress like a superhero. So I got to be five again, too. <laughs> And, you know, the different games and therapies, we just tell them we're, we're working on their superhero skills. And kids a lot of times really like that. So. Oh, for sure. For Makes sure. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, good. Well, one of the, you brought up one of the things that I definitely want to do as another topic, which is, you know, with school being really stressful, I see a lot of um, a little bit older children, the, the teenagers, things like that, really having lots of depression. So um, I think we'll go ahead and, and um, maybe save that for another topic. Um, but I definitely want it, you know, people to know because I think one of the more uh, frustrating things is, is, that, is that people, parents don't know where to reach out. That really gives their kids what they need because the first thing the pe pediatricians want to do is put them on medication and we haven't really talked about medication but i do want to address that because it's counterproductive and mm. parents don't necessarily get that aspect of it because their pediatrician's not a neurologist right and that's the problem with a lot of the medications the medications for things like adhd or um you know especially some of the learning disorders they're meant to blunt the brain so they shut down the whole thing it, you know like the, the drugs for adhd they're meant to shut the brain off right. and a lot of kids develop depression and other things because their brain isn't working as efficiently anymore and sadness and depression has been linked to issues in again those same areas of the brain and a lack of development there and also a lot of those drugs lead to um, a lot of other conditions later in life you know yeah. there's some research now that long term and they don't put kids on Ritalin anymore but long term Ritalin use is now being associated with Parkinson's early on oh, right. so you see these adult the, yeah these adult yeah. males with Parkinson's disease they were most often on Ritalin when they were in right. school so yeah um, we don't test, we don't test the, um, medications, uh, for long, you know, on children. So we don't really know the long-term effect of the medications on children. Um, you know, and I can only imagine based on, I mean, the conversations that we usually have are, uh, you know, what, what are the effects on the limbic system? And, uh, you know, I can only imagine that if you're telling the brain when the brain's trying to learn cues for emotional and relationships and communication because that nervous system is not completely developed until we're at least 18 where kids can actually read facial expressions uh, accurately for the emotion that the person's expressing so when you're taking a medication and you're dulling that process then you the, you know it's it's hard to redevelop that um neuro pathway for understanding uh, communication, relationships, um, facial expressions, and reading accurately. Yeah, you're essentially medically delaying development um, and delaying maturation of the brain. So, yeah, it can be an issue, you know, and, and leading into the depression stuff, you know, these kids that are on these drugs, it's, you know, the second leading cause of death in teenagers right now is suicide. Wow. That should never be the case. Like, kids, never. kids need help. They need, you know, they need parents and need the adults and they need the medical community to help them through that they're that's not what they should be dying from yeah for sure okay we'll we'll move that one to our next conversation because i think it's hugely needed and solutions are needed and drugs are not the solution i mean we've been in holistic medicine i mean me for for over 30 years and drugs have never been a solution they could save our life in a moment but um, they were never intended for, you know, continued use and lifelong use. So uh, yeah. great topic in being able to offer solutions. So, well, great, thanks. I really appreciate, um, you know, spending, spending time with me chatting. I've been wanting to do this to really be able to get some information out to people as to what we do. And, you know, it's not easily explained in a sentence. And I think that this topic is very, very needed. I don't even know what the percentage of kids are that are diagnosed with some type of learning disability anymore. Um, but I know it's, uh, it's on the rise and ridiculously high. So. Yeah, I mean, just look at autism numbers. Those are the ones that are the most researched right now. By 2050, one in two kids um, are going to be on the spectrum. So 50%, that's... Yeah, that's it's for our kids, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not our kids. That's not our, you know, there's, there's no reason for that. So we can, all, you know, we have to really just make sure that we're um, being proactive because uh, that's a scary number. Yeah, we got to do better. Yeah. For sure. All right, Dr. Longyear, thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Bye-bye.